welcome back. Lesson 17 at home learning with Miss Ellis. If you're your first time, please try to go back to the beginning and do these in order because each lesson really is building on each other. I tried to build it up sequentially. Um, it is meant to be interactive, so you do need to be there with your kid. This is not a passive learning opportunity. This is meant to be an engaging or interactive learning opportunity like I would normally have in class. So that means you grown-ups, are supposed to be pausing the video and really like digging, doing the work that I would normally be doing of making sure everybody's with you and, and engaging in the big thinking that happens. So now that we have that introduction, we just finished a mini unit on animal habitats where we were reading informational nonfiction. Now, kiddos, do you remember what informational nonfiction is all about? Like, what is it trying to do? The author's purpose, which is the big idea we're going to be thinking about in this unit, the author's purpose is to teach you information, right? That's why it's called informational nonfiction, right? Information that is real informational nonfiction. They are trying to teach you facts, information about something. We're starting a new genre now that is not informational nonfiction. It's narrative. Now, narrative isn't a one small category of genre. It's sort of like an umbrella. So if you picture like the trunk of a tree is narrative, and then there's all these branches of different types of genre that are narrative forms. So Let's use that same analogy. So informational nonfiction, the trunk of the tree would be nonfiction, right? Real information. And then there's all these different genre that are that form. They're nonfiction. Informational nonfiction is one branch. So now we're going to be thinking about narrative form, which is the trunk of the tree. And there's all these different types of narrative forms. So let me show you a little diagram I made to help us understand the narrative form. So narrative is another way for just saying a story. So a narrative is it telling a story. And this is a tradition that has been around forever. The first civilizations told a lot of stories and, and they, before writing was developed people just had to remember stories and tell them orally not everybody knew how to read once reading and writing became um, were developed not everyone could read and write so a lot of our storytelling had to happen just talking to each other and telling stories we didn't have televisions we didn't have telephones we didn't have ways to spread we didn't have books that were widely accessible so stories had to be told just person to person around a campfire or at the dinner table or at the palace, right? Someone had to come and, and perform. So that tradition has carried on and now we have books and videos and movies and, and poems. We, we have all these different ways of telling stories now. So when it comes to books, the narrative form means it tells a story and it has characters. Hi everybody. So we were talking about our organization chart here, thinking about the narrative form. So again, we were talking about how like the narrative form is kind of the trunk of the tree and then there's all these branches that come off. So the narrative form, we most often see that in the fiction genres. So things like sci-fi or science fiction, um, traditional literature like folk tales and fairy tales and legends. Realistic fiction, so stories we tell that seem real, but they're not real. They're from somebody's imagination. Historical fiction, so that's where someone finds an interesting person or time in the past and then writes a story like they were there. Um, and it seems like it's real, but it's really somebody taking real information and turning it into a story. Mystery and fantasy are other fiction genre. So we also have, believe it or not, some people forget we also have nonfiction genre that are in the narrative form. So you might have a narrative nonfiction where they're telling a story to help you understand a real phenomenon or a real thing. Biography, a story of another person. And then there's a few that are sort of connected to each other. Autobiography, memoir, and personal narrative. They're real stories someone tells about their own life. So... This is a simple breakdown of what like elementary schoolers should understand about genre in the narrative form. You can find fiction genres and nonfiction genres in the narrative form. So we're going to read five different books 
from uh, that are in the narrative form and then we're going to try to figure out what genre we think they are and what we think the author's purpose is so there's a really strong connection between understanding genre and understanding author's purpose what is the author trying to do and if you can sort of understand those two it makes it easier to unpack and understand a new text so sorry my dogs couldn't allow me to be out here by myself so they have decided to join me so if at any point i appear to be distracted <laughs> or if there's a strange noise that's what it is so sorry in advance so here we go let's first think back to what we read last time we were reading these books about the desert so take a minute to remember kiddos tell the adult that's next to you what do you remember about life in the desert so pause discuss and then come back so hopefully you remember a lot of things about the desert what it's like there what's hard for animals how animals have learned to survive there and what we're going to do now is read a new text Remember, we're doing a narrative form, so the type of book is going to be really different than the last ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this book called A Desert Scrapbook, Dawn to Dusk in the Sonoran Desert. Now, this is something we haven't really seen before in our other texts. It's called a subtitle. So this is really the name of the book, A Desert Scrapbook, but then this is also part of the title, Dawn to Dusk in the Sonoran Desert, and it's by Virginia Wright Frierson. So right away, let's think about what genre this might be. I've already told you it's in the narrative form. So now what you're going to think about is taking some clues from the cover, what genre we think it is. So let me hold this up here. If you need to pause it here, family, so that you can look at it together and really talk about it, please do that. So let's look back at this cover, L pay attention like we did with the other text, pay attention to the name of the book and the illustrations. They're going to give you clues as to what the book is about or what's going to happen in the book. A desert scrapbook, dawn to dusk in the Sonoran Desert. So pause here, family, talk about it together. What on earth, what genre might this be? So now you've hopefully just talked about that and I'm not actually gonna answer this yet because I really want you to hold on to your predictions and then confirm or disconfirm, disprove those predictions as we read. So here we go, a desert scrapbook. A desert scrapbook. The sun is just coming up over the distant mountains. I pack up my painting gear, watercolors, paper, water, bo water bottle, brush and pencil, hat, folding chair. Now I must hurry outside to sketch some birds and animals while they are active in the cool early hours. So I don't know if you're making a connection, but remember when we were reading our desert books, we noticed a lot of the animals were nocturnal. They were most active at night because it was cooler. So that's the same in the morning when it's a little, it's not quite as cold as nighttime, but it's um, still cool and more comfortable than daytime. Um, now I must hurry outside to sketch some birds and animals while they are active in the cool early hours. This summer day promises to be another scorcher. So that means a really hot day. I find a beautiful view and sit quietly, listening and waiting for the animals to get used to my presence. 
Some people think that our Sonoran Desert is just dry land and mountains, strange plants, and great sweeping skies. But look very carefully and you will see many interesting creatures. So I'm going to give you a chance to look at these pictures up close. See if you see any little creatures. Sorry about that noise in the background. Once, on a spring day, when I was out painting a prickly pear cactus, a de let me see, I need to get this all the way in the camera. A, a desert tortoise crept up to nibble on a ripe fruit. Remember we saw that picture of the bird finding its water from the fruit on the cactus? So here's another animal that uses that fruit in the desert. Once on a spring day when I was out painting a prickly pear cactus, a desert tortoise crept up to nibble on a ripe fruit. I quickly sketched it until it crawled away with a red stained mouth. We need some more sunlight, don't we, so you can see the book better. And then there's a picture pasted in here that says prickly pear blossom, May, Another time when I was painting wildflowers, I noticed that a shadow kept passing over my white paper. When I looked up, I was surprised to see a vulture circling right above me. It was so close I could see its wrinkled head and the sunlight through its large wings. It flew off as soon as I waved my arms to show I was not dead and it would not be eating me for lunch. So vultures are what we call scavengers. So they will eat anything they can find, even if it's already dead, even if it's rotten, they'll still eat it. They're pretty amazing. Today, let's see. Today I sketched some doves. I am startled by a road runner bursting from behind a nearby barrel cactus. It catches a zebra-tailed lizard and dashes off leaving a little cloud of dust. There's another picture with a caption, Barrel Cactus Bloom, August, my favorite cactus flower. A cactus wren emerges, emerges from its nest of twigs and dry grasses in a jumping ho hoya, choya, excuse me, I draw many studies of the nest and the mother wren as she flies back and forth with beetle larvae for her babies. And then look, look what she put in the book. She taped in a little feather, cactus wren feather. And then here are the studies she did or the little drawings she did to practice drawing a cactus wren. Let's see, how do you, let's try it this way. The sun is getting higher and the day is getting hotter. Most of the animals are now resting in cooler, shady places to escape the boiling heat. They will not come out until the cool of evening and the cover of darkness. So now there's all these little drawings with captions underneath them. So I'm gonna show you each drawing one at a time and read what it says. So here we go. A desert pack, let's see. A desert pack rat is asleep, curled up deep inside its messy mound of cactus joints, sticks, leaves, bark, and rocks. Do you see the desert pack rat? He's right here. A desert scorpion hides under a rock, its babies clustered safely on its back. A tarantula waits until nightfall in its cool underground tunnel. A western diamondback rattlesnake stays cool in the abandoned hole of an antelope squirrel. 
A kangaroo rat lies asleep curled up all day in its deep burrow. They never need to drink water, but get all the moisture they need from the seeds and plants gathered at night. That reminds me of some of the other animals we learned about. An elf owl sleeps in a hole in a saguaro cactus. A black-tailed jackrabbit rests in a shallow hole it has dug in the shade of a mesquite tree. Whoa, look at that beautiful illustration. The creamy white flowers of the saguaros have finished blooming for the year and now the fruit begins to ripen. It is feasted upon by many desert animals, insects, and birds. The, the Gila woodpecker has a nest in the hole it has pecked in the giant cactus. So here is another feather taped into the book, Gila woodpecker feather. Look, do you see what's in there? And those are saguaro flowers in May. I rest in the shade of a Palo Verde tree and look at some of the seeds and pods I've collected. Above me, a curve-billed thrasher cools itself by widely opening its beak. This small saguaro is about 25 years old. Look at all those seeds and pods and fruits she collected. Palo Verde pods, jojoba nut, creosote bush, cat claw acadia, acacia, devil's claw before the pod opens, saguaro fruit, prickly pear fruit, desert willow pod, and mesquite beans. Have you ever seen anything that looks like those? I know some of them look different to me. This story happened a few years ago. I was sitting on the hot ground, <laughs> painting a mountain view when I noticed a slight movement under a bush. My eyes focused on a huge rattlesnake coiled and perfectly camouflaged next to my foot. I eased back trembling, and as the snake slowly moved away, I saw a large lump in its middle. Luckily for me, it must have just eaten a cottontail. Thunder grumbles in the distance, and I notice the air is heavier. Maybe today will bring the first rain of the summer monsoons. The dry stalk of the ocatillo wave in the hot wind, welcoming the coming storm. I head for home, looking down as I always do when I walk in the desert, careful not to brush against a spiny cactus or twist an ankle on a loose rock. Can you tell what's happening now? Let's read. I drink a cool lemonade in my studio, which is an old, which is in an old water tower at the house. The long awaited rain begins to pour from the clouds, drenching the parched ground. The shallow roots of the saguaros drink up the precious moisture. The cacti will begin to swell with the water they must store through the long droughts. With a great crashing of thunder, lightning strikes the tallest saguaro on the mountain. It will collapse and the skeleton will stand. So this is what it looks like after a lightning strike. And the skeleton will stand with the wooden ribs reaching to the sky like fingers. But the fallen cactus will provide shelter and food for many insects and small animals. Wow. Look at this. 
I stay inside until the storm passes, carefully sorting some of the cactus spines I have collected. Prickly pear, saguaro, hoya, and barrel. I try to remember some of the patterns I have seen in the desert. So I'm just gonna hold this up for you to see. Maybe I can read it too, let's see if I turn. Oh, hold on. Come here. Come. Come. This is Shyla. <laughs> she likes to be on my lap, and she's a little mad at me because I didn't hold her. So she was whining at my feet. Sorry. Say hi. She's my little girl. All right. Sorry, I have to get her situated so I can keep going. <laughs> There's always some sort of an interruption. All right, so she says, I try to remember all of the patterns I saw. So let's look at the picture she drew of all the patterns she saw out in the desert. So this is a prickly pear pad, tortoise shell, gila monster, coral snake, owl feather, diamondback rattler, cross section of a saguaro. So cross section means like if you took the whole cactus and then sliced it you know, if this is the cactus stock, right, like this, if you just cut it like that, the cross section is when you look at it. So if you picture an apple shaped like this with the stem up here, if you sort of turn that on its side and then slice it, that would be the cross section of an apple. So, cross section of a saguaro, Hoya cactus skeleton, Hoya cactus, Desert rock, saguaro plate, uh, pleats, bird tracks, spider web, black widow hourglass, and my saguaro rib ceiling. So now let me put them close for you to really look at them carefully. And of course, as always, if you need more time, just pause the video. Now let's see what's on the next page. Shed snakeskin, desert millipede, desert centipede, Cottontail droppings, so that means poop. So scientists who are learning about animals actually spend some time looking at their poop. And that probably sounds kind of gross and silly, but really scientists have to look at all that stuff in order to see what animals eat, see if they're healthy, and to figure out more about them. So it might sound weird, but that's the reality of what scientists do. So here we go. So cottontail droppings. Now I have a big yard with deer that like to come and visit. And so I am always seeing their droppings in my yard. Um, rattlesnake rattle, cow backbones, ocotillo, saguaro flower, quail wing, quail eggs, constellations, horned lizard skin, teddy bear hoya or choya, Monarch butterfly and looking down at Saguaro's shadows. <coughs> hey, stop it. You're being rude. Sorry, I warned you. <laughs> now look at this. She did a before and after. Ugh, how do I get this so you can see? And I have good light. So there's the before. And there is the after. Can you tell what's different? Let's see. I love to come outside right after a rain has freshened the air and settled the dust. I walk to the dry arroyo near my house and hear a roaring sound. Suddenly the arroyo is filled with churning water. So much rain falls in such a short time it can't soak into the ground. The water collects in stream beds the mountain, uh, the water collects in many stream beds in the mountains and becomes a muddy, roaring flash flood into the valleys. Don't ever camp in an arroyo. By evening, the 
the spade foot toads that have been buried deep underground all year have dug up to the surface. They croak and sing and lay eggs in the muddy pools. The eggs must develop into tadpoles and then baby toads before the, t the puddles dry up in a few days. So that means they lay the eggs and they only have a few days to turn into toads that can live on their own. That's amazing. I'm having trouble orienting the book today. The toads eat many insects in their few days above ground. Then they dig back underground for almost a year to wait for another rainy season. There's a, a caption under the picture. Once I saw several garter snakes feasting on spadefoot tadpoles in a puddle. I sit unseen on the rocks and sketch a herd of javelinas as they eat prickly pear pads and saguaro fruits. They leave a strong musky scent in the air and deep prints in the soft mud from their small hooves. This group trampled all the tomato plants in my garden last night. Turning the wrong way. Ah! <laughs> there is always a glorious sunset after a rainstorm. The pungent smell of the desert creosote bush perfumes the air. I sit on the rocks with my watercolors trying to capture the warm glowing light and fiery colors. The desert sky grows dark as I return home. A great horned owl sweeps soundlessly above my head. The air fills with sounds of life after night falls in the desert. Nocturnal, oh, there's that word again. Nocturnal creatures creep out of their tunnels and burrows. I hear an elf owl calling from its hole in a saguaro. The toads croak and sing. Coyotes yip and howl. At the studio, let's see if I can bring this close enough. At the studio, I spread out my sketches of the Sonoran desert plants and animals and the feathers, spines, and seeds I found. I think maybe I will collect today's work into a scrapbook that will give a feeling of this desert day from dawn to dusk. Outside my tower window, thousands of bright stars pierce the immense blackness of the beautiful night sky. So take a second now and just talk. What are you thinking? What are you wondering? What, what's on your mind after reading that book? So pause and then come back. So now that you've had a chance just to sort of talk about what you're thinking, let's think about what genre, sorry, um, yeah, what genre we think this book is. So we know it's in the narrative form. Now, do you think it seems like it's fiction, like a story somebody made up? Or does it seem it might seem like it might be nonfiction and real? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I think it's probably nonfiction and real. So now let's think. Is it narrative nonfiction? Is it telling you the story of an animal or... Um, a place? Is it a biography telling all about one person's life, trying to teach us information about that person? Or is it someone telling the story of their own life? Yeah, you're right. It's somebody telling the story of their own life, like an autobiography, memoir, or personal narrative would. Those are the three genre up here. So this genre is, is sort of like a personal narrative. That's really what this book is. It's one person telling a story. Um, they use it in sort of a journal format. So it's sort of 
journal, scrapbook, personal narrative all put together. Now, did you notice what the author's purpose is? Did you think about that? What do you think this author was trying to do? Why did they write this book? Now, if you're not sure what I mean when I say that, there's usually some big sort of themes. Usually someone's writing the book, a book to um, teach you information about something or someone's writing a book to entertain you, right? Just for fun. Or someone's writing it to persuade you or convince you of something. They want you to believe something or do something. Um, so those are the three big sort of groups. So take a second and talk about that. Do you think this book was trying to teach us something? Was it just to be fun? Or was it trying to convince us to do or believe something? Talk about that and then come back. So hopefully now you've talked about that together and maybe you came to the conclusion, this book is really just trying to teach us information. It's, it's an interesting combination. That's why, even though it's narrative form, even though it's a story, it is still nonfiction. It is still trying to teach us information. So she is trying to teach us information about what? Yeah, about the Sonoran Desert near where she lives. So her whole goal, Virginia Wright Frierson, her whole goal was to try to get us to learn about what this place is like. So her purpose was to teach us information about the Sonoran Desert. Great job. Now, <clears throat> this is the end of my questions for you to stop and talk about, but I have one little, well, two little projects for you. So let's look at that. So what I'd like you to do now, thinking about this, um, thinking about this text, is going back to comparing it to the last one we read. Now I did my best as I was reading to point out places when I noticed there was a connection, but hopefully you noticed some others too. So I'd like you to do another Venn diagram. I know it feels like we've done a million, but they are so perfect for elementary learners because they're really simple and it's a really visual way of understanding how to compare things. So just to remind you, two circles, one text in one circle and one in the other. So things that are only true about this book go here, things that are only true about this book go here, and then things that are true about both go in the middle. So I really want you to go and be detectives. Find as many things as you can that were different or the same about those two texts and write them here. So if you need to, go back and watch the videos again and then record them here. So let's pause here, do this work and come back because I'm going to show you some of the things I want you to notice. So hopefully you have a paper that looks something like this. You've got some notes there about what's the same and different. So I definitely want to make sure you noticed that there were times that the author really used some of the same information we got in our desert animal books, right? She talked about how animals were finding water and food, much like we learned in our books. She talked about how animals survived the heat, how they found their water, just like we read in our books. So those things so far would go in the middle because it was true about both. Um, something that was different, of course, is the genre, right? These books, all they were doing is just telling us facts, like a list of facts. Whereas this book was telling us a story and there were facts embedded within it. So. That one, that's what makes this informational nonfiction and what makes this narrative nonfiction or a personal narrative. Something else that was different, of course, is that because these are informational nonfiction, they had text features. They had um, uh, nonfiction um, features. So this book, did it have headings and labels? Some of those things, right? It has labels, um, captions under a picture. We notice that a lot. Here's a, a label for the pictures, right? But there's no real headings. There's no bolded words. 
there's a caption under a photograph. So really, because it's a journal, it didn't have a table of contents and an index and fact boxes, right? It was just her story and then some pictures with captions. So the, the features of the texts were very different because of the genre. So those are the main things I want you to notice. I'm sure there were lots of other little things. Maybe you noticed specific animals that were in both books or new animals that were in one or the other. Um, maybe you noticed specific things about weather patterns that were new. So it's great. Whatever you noticed was the same or different. All of that is just improving your thinking and observation skills and you should feel really proud of all that you found. So great job with that. Um, I do have one suggestion for you, one activity you could do after reading this text. So I myself am a bit of a, an artist, I guess. I love to draw and paint, and I am a big naturalist. I love to go outside and notice things and collect things. So much like Virginia Wright Frierson, I actually have my own scrapbook. So you might not know this, but three years ago, I took a sabbatical, which basically means I took a year off of teaching and I saved all my money and I went traveling. And so I took a year to travel around the continent of South America, which my friends, if you don't know where that is, so we are here, let me turn it this way. So we, most of us probably watching this are here in North America. I know I'm right over here in Boston you might live near me or you might live somewhere else. But what I did is I took a year and I traveled around South America, which is this whole continent. And in that time I visited, per, um, where am I? Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, Brazil. And then I also made it down here to Antarctica. So I saw some really amazing things, saw some beautiful animals. I had an amazing time. And so for that whole time, I kept a scrapbook, much like Virginia Frierson did, or um, Virginia Wright Frierson. I knew there was another name I was missing. So I wanted to show you a couple pages from my scrapbook. So um, the first one I'm going to show you, I'm going to actually remind you, this is one I showed you before. So this was a page um, where I actually took some penguin feathers. And then I also found, um, so what I do is I find something that I want to save and I attach it into my scrapbook. And then I write a little note about where I found it or how I found it so that I can remember. So here is my first page that I'm going to show you. And up at the top, all of these up here are penguin feathers. So if you notice, they're really kind of small. And what makes them different is their quill part, the center part, is really stiff and curved. Most feathers, it's a little bit more flexible. But because they don't need to fly, they, their feathers are a little bit heavier. Then I also found this um, piece of a flower that I pressed. So that basically means I... Um, put it between the pages of a book so it dried and stayed flat. And then I wrote a little note here that I found it in a place called El Calafate, which is um, it's this amazing mountain that I, that I hiked to. So, well, it's near an amazing mountain that I hiked to, but that's where I got that from. Let's see, there's one other page I wanted to show you. Oh boy, let's see. There's so many things I could show you, it's hard to know where to begin. Ah, this is a cool one. So this page, I have a lot of different things taped down. I found a cool leaf from a vineyard, so where they grow grapes. I found this beautiful like moss. I found these seeds. So supposedly there's this legend or a story people tell in this part of Argentina. They say that if you eat these berries, then you will never leave El Calafate, that area. And I ate a bunch of them. They were really tasty. I drew a picture of what the berry looks like. And then I saved the seeds to put in my notebook. So I did come home. So the legend was not true for me. <laughs> Let's see if I can find one more different type of page to show you. Oh, yeah. 
This is kind of like um, our author. These are quills from a cactus. So they're really stiff and very sharp and very long. That was in Bolivia. There's a big, big desert there. And I took a couple quills. Um, and then one more thing I'll show you is, ooh, here. I um, spent a lot of time in the rainforest in Peru. I was living uh, in this little camp in the middle of the rainforest and I spent a lot of time looking at the bugs. I think bugs are fascinating. So I did some studies, which means just like she watched the bird and drew it carefully, I did the same thing for bugs. So here are some of the insects that I saw when I was in Peru. I tried to draw them the real size. So that's why at the top it says actual size. So this is the real size of these critters. So right away you might notice this is a caterpillar. Look how big it is. That is the real size of that caterpillar. It's as big as my hand. So I saw a stick. We, one of the books we read, it talked about a stick bug. That's a real one that I saw. Um, remember how they were talking about the toads in the desert? They go underground for a year and they come out. Well, in warm places, there are these bugs called cicadas. And cicadas actually live underground for years, <laughs> more than one year. They, I think it's eight years. So they live underground as like a little larva <clears throat> for like eight years. And then when it's finally time, they come out, they change their body. They don't, come, they live as larvae, but they live as a different kind of shape. They come out and they change their body into a new shape. Then they're only alive for a few days before they die. So it's pretty amazing. Um, and this is one type of cicada. That's, I think it was called the lantern something. Yeah, I didn't write a note. That's surprising. But that's one type of cicada. And then this is another type of cicada. So this one is really unusual. I didn't even know this type of cicada existed. And that's how big it was. That's huge. <laughs> so um, if you have ever thought about it, or if you have like a little notebook at home, I'll tell you, it's really fun. So if you haven't kept a scrapbook before, this is a really great chance to try it. I showed you a little bit of my scrapbook. I included feathers and drawings and leaves and seeds and pieces of flowers, right? All different things just to help me remember. And every time I look at them, honestly, I can remember exactly where I was and exactly what I saw. So if you haven't tried this, this is a really great time to do it. Um, maybe your family will go out exploring and you can bring it with you and, and do some sketching just like myself in Virginia. So I hope this has inspired you to try something new. Um, and I hope you had some good luck comparing our texts. So thank you so much. I am so excited. If you've made it all the way to Lesson 17, then you have stuck with me for a long time. Thank you so much for your patience and support. And I'll see you next time for our next narrative.